Welcome to Around Town, the show that provides information about North Andover and its surrounding towns in the Merrimack Valley. I'm your host, Jim Fazio, and I'm here today with my guest, Dave Dumaresk, the owner of Farmer Dave's in Dracut. This year, the farm was a weekly participant in the North Andover Farmer's Market, which has proven to be a very successful thing in the town. Today, we're going to talk about the farm and what it's doing in the area. Dave, how long have you been in this business, in the farm business? Well, I've been in the agricultural business to a certain extent uh, for the past 30 years, but I've been a self-employed farmer for the past 20 years. Wow, that's a while. And what is the CSA? What is that? CSA uh, stands for Community Supported Agriculture. And that's a program that I started about 10 years ago where um, eaters, such as you, I mean, everybody eats food, <clears throat> eaters um, will form a community and they're supporting the agriculture. So that's the community supported agriculture. So basically people sign up for a share of the harvest from the farm. So basically I become your farmer and every week you get a box or two of food uh, which is on display here and we have two different size boxes uh, for our vegetables we have this larger yellow box and this smaller green box you can get the larger size or the smaller size and then in addition to that we also have a, a fruit share um, which we have you know a sample of here which you know all these uh, whatever vegetables or fruit will change throughout the season and all the vegetables are grown by me so you know who your farmer is you know who's growing your food and where it's coming from. All right, that sounds pretty cool. Now, the P you charge people for this, of course, right? <clears throat> yes, correct. Right. It's a weekly thing? or It's a weekly thing. Uh, traditionally, uh, the CSA members, uh, it'll vary from year to year, but usually they save 25 to 50% 50, 50 versus buying it elsewhere. Like, so it's, it's, a fresh. Huge, it's super, fresh. super fresh. And if we have an abundant season, we're just basically passing that on to the shareholders. They're considered shareholders, uh -huh, uh, shareholders of the season's harvest. Right, oh, excellent. How did you get involved? with them, not the end of a farmer's market. Uh, Phil uh, called me up or sent me an email, I think it was in the middle of the winter, yeah. and said, hey, you know, we're starting this market. Would you, you know, like to consider participating? Because he had heard that, you know, we were, you know, good farmers in the area and had some good references on us, so that, he uh, contacted us. That's a good opportunity, us. too, to get your name, I mean, around and yeah. tell people what it is, what it's all about. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I yeah, we, we, do, we do the CSA program, but we also uh, sell our product at several farmers markets in the area, and we also have three farm stands, the, uh, the East Street Farm Stand in Tewksbury, mm -hmm. we grow in Tewksbury, uh, the Brock's Farm Stand in Dracut, and the Hill Orchard Farm Stand in, in, in Westford. So we actually grow product in all three of those towns, Tewksbury, Dracut, and Westford. Um, I didn't grow up in a farming family, so I didn't inherit a farm or anything like that, uh, but I bought a preserved farm about 10 years ago, uh -huh. so it can only be farmed, um, but I've cobbled together over the past 20 years about five different farm parcels to give me almost 100 acres to grow on. Wow. And right. you can see the variety of product that we grow, and the, you know we grow a lot more than this as well. You must have a crew that helps you, right? I mean, oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, there's no way I could do this all alone. I mean, and the way we grow, we grow more. We're using traditional methods. We're not mechanically harvesting uh, product. So, like things like these beans here, they they take a lot of time to pick these things. Whereas a lot of the beans that you'll find in the supermarket are actually now mechanically harvested. Oh yeah. And they'll right. have to change varieties to a variety that has a thicker. Um, a thicker pulp to it so that it can withstand the beating of the machines. But we use more traditional varieties and everything is hand harvested. Hand harvested. Well, yeah. That's a good thing to know. I'm a farmer too, but I don't do half as much as this. There's yeah, some we've, stuff uh, here, I don't even know what, they, what it is. I'm Over sure the years, we've, we've really expanded uh, the amount of product that we grow. Really? And also the season that we offer our product in. It used to be that, you know, the first year I offered the CSA, it ran for 13 weeks. Right. Then I expanded it to 18 weeks. So, you know, it was July, August, September, the peak season. Right. <clears throat> and now we actually go a full 42 weeks of the year. Actually, 41. Oh, wow. That's, so that's, you know. So you can grow in the fall and in the winter. And yep. So a lot of product, like, like uh, you know, the broccoli here and the Romanesco. We also grow a lot of potatoes. Those things will go right into December. Uh, and then we'll put things into storage for the winter. Right. But then we also have greenhouses. So the first week of March, we'll actually start harvesting baby greens out of our greenhouses and also provide things like, you know, carrots out of storage and potatoes and apples we put into long-term storage as well. So we're feeding uh, our, our members for, uh, you know, 10 months of the year. 
That's which, great, yeah. fresh produce. We could go year round and a lot of the members find that. What we do is that, that last week in December, um, the last share, we actually bulk it up so that they'll be able to store product in their home refrigerator or their basement for another month, you know, especially with all the winter squash and potatoes oh, and yeah. apples. So they usually have our food actually almost year round because they'll st store it themselves until January, end of January, early February, and the first week of March it starts all up again. Wow. How long have you been involved with the town of not the end of in general? Well, I've sold to, um, before I started the CSA program, I sold to uh, small stores and farm stands in North Andover, you know, as long as 20 years ago. Um, so I've been providing product to, you know, the townspeople for, for a long time. And uh, we also offer the CSA at a pickup location in, uh, at Merrimack College. Uh -huh. uh, we have a lot of North Andoverites that pick up at our, our Groundwork Lawrence location uh, in one of the old refurbished mills, yep, yep. not far from the uh, North Andover line. Right. Have you done anything with the local farms in the area? Oh yeah, no, I know a lot of the local farms. Um, and you know, I go to, lot, go to a lot of um, fruit growers and vegetable growers meetings and talk to them about you know, the goings on and yeah. share a lot of secrets with them. Smolax Farm? Oh yeah, Mike Smolax a great guy. He supports local agriculture. I went to school with him. Oh, did you? No yeah. kidding. Yeah. Okay. You're lucky. He's a good yeah. guy. <laughs> <laughs> this year the state rolled out something called the HIP program. Yeah. What does that involve? The HIP program, it stands for the uh, Healthy Initiatives Program. Uh, so people that are accepting uh, or receiving SNAP or you know your, your um, food stamps, mm -hmm. they now have a, a, an addition to that to try to get people to eat healthier because everybody's started to realize that a lot of the lower income people, especially, not just them, were not eating healthy food. So they made an addition <clears throat> starting this year <clears throat> where if you um, buy fresh fruits and vegetables that came from local farms, you can actually double your money that month from that month's uh, benefits, huh. depending on the size of the family, anywhere between, I think, 40 and $80 a month. So a lot of people are starting to realize they have that added benefit and they're actually eating a lot more fruits and vegetables using that little blue snap uh, snap card with that hip benefit. Right, which is a lot healthier for, yeah. for the kids. And, and people, for, a lot of people at the, the North Andover Farmers Market you know, are showing up uh, with their SNAP uh, cards and, really? and, and using that. Really, and you that there, yeah. yeah. And they're basically, in a sense, they're doubling their money on that card by eating fresher. So again, it's, it's a societal benefit because we're, you know, we're trying to get these lower income people to eat healthier yep. so that then they have healthier lives and right. healthier uh, health care costs later on in life. Right. And so it's a small investment we're making into society by providing that benefit so that they eat, eat healthier. And it's also helping these local farms like myself right. exactly. to you know, uh, build an additional market um, with our fruit, fresh fruits and vegetables. What are some of the main crops you grow at the farm? Well, you can see a lot of them here. Okay. Uh, we grow a lot of apples, about 15 different varieties. Apples. Pears, uh, watermelon. We grow a yellow watermelon, a red watermelon, several varieties of cantaloupe. Um, blueberries, raspberries, strawberries, blackberries, as you can see here. Um, nectarines, peaches, plums, apricots, pluots, which is a cross between a, a plum and, a, and an apricot. Oh, those are my favorite. Um, you can see here, actually, this is, is the that one image farm? of That's my farm. Uh, that's my house over there, and that's our new building there. It has uh, new refrigeration, uh, geothermal heating and cooling. So it's actually a green building. We also have just put solar panels on the roof nice. to provide the electricity for it. This is our blueberry patch here. We have strawberries in this section. Uh, in this greenhouse, we have a, two more greenhouses on this farm in addition to that one. Uh, that one this spring, we were harvesting kale and spinach out of that greenhouse the first week of March. Huh. Um, so it's a, it's a very diverse farm. Uh, you can see a lot of the irrigation pipe down there. How many acres is it? <clears throat> this farm here is the only farm that I own. It's, like I said, it's pre preserved under the state APR program, the uh -huh. Agricultural Preservation Restriction. Um, and it's about 30 acres, but I grow on a total of about 100 acres. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah. That keeps you busy. Sure does, <laughs> sure does. And then you can see, as, as far as the vegetables grow, we grow a huge variety. You know, your traditional crops like summer squash, zucchini, cucumbers, corn, tomatoes, but we also grow a lot of um, different crops like, uh, you know, purple cauliflower in addition to a lot of regular white flour. I never saw that before. Yeah, that one's called Romanesco cauliflower or Romanesco broccoli. That one actually, <clears throat> you know, I served in the Peace Corps in Ecuador and I, I was asked to visit a, um, a local uh, large farm, a hacienda, that was growing a lot of um, broccoli and cabbage, but they were also growing that 
that product, and I had never seen it there. Turns out there was, they grew about 40 acres of that Romanesco, and they were shipping it over to a, a, a large freezing plant. It would get frozen and then shipped off to Italy. Huh. Italy. Italy. And hence, and the name is Romanesco. Yeah. It sounds really. like Rome. That's right. And uh, a few years later, I actually happened to be in Italy, and I started to see that all over the place. So when I started up my farm, I found some of the seed, and I've been growing that for almost about 20 years now. Oh. It's similar to a cauliflower, but it has a nice, sweet, nutty flavor. Just Our CSA that. members have learned to love it. Um, I think it just has so much more flavor than your traditional cauliflower, and it's also a fractal. You know what a fractal is, Jim? No. So a fractal is, is you usually find it more in mathematics or geometry, but it's an image, and it's an image of itself, of itself, of itself, of itself, indefinitely. Okay. So gotcha. if you were to take that under a magnifying glass, right. you would see it over and over again. And you can kind of see this here is a point, and you can see all these little points right, are right. another image of itself. Wow, that's interesting. It's a natural fractal. A fractal? Yeah. Hey, I'm learning something today. You can it's learn things cool. every day, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about um, some of the ways you reach out to members as well as uh, potential customers? Sure. Um, things like this show, you know, we offer our product in a lot of different communities and a lot of different communities have me on their radio shows and their local access shows. We also have a huge um, following on uh, Facebook. Uh, with our members, we do a, a weekly newsletter to let them know what's gonna be in the share, offer them some different recipes and things like that. Uh, more recently, we've started our Vegisode series because a lot of people have said, you know, they don't know how to cook things as much right. as some of the older generations right. used to, especially some of these less common things that you don't find in the supermarkets. So we started this Vegisode series, and now we have well over 50 different, um, basically it's a, similar to a cooking show. It is a cooking show, right. but we educate the, uh, the viewer, and each one is different. Some of them will be about you know, how, to, how to prepare uh, cauliflowers, right. how to can tomatoes. That one now has had almost 10,000 views. That's incredible. That's incredible. What to do with peppers, um, how to store things. We have a, a one show on how to store some of your winter vegetables. Another one on how, when you get your CSA, what do you do with it? Because you get this box of vegetables that's gonna last a week. What should you eat first? How do you store it properly in your refrigerator? Um, it's, it's been a wonderful series that we're just, we're taking member feedback on what else you would like to see in this Vegisode series. We're also getting a lot of different groups, um, a lot of groups that, you know, like local um, health centers, especially down in the Boston area, really? that are actually utilizing our Vegisode series as a teaching mechanism for people that they're trying to assist to help eat, uh, create healthier families. Because if now, if they're getting this hip benefit, right they're gonna be buying more fruits and vegetables. Right. So yeah. they need to know how to properly prepare that food. That's right. And that's where our Vegisode series has really come in very handy. And it's no charge, you know, we don't charge people to, right. to use it or anything right. like that. That's a good idea. It is. It's a real good idea. Yeah. How did you learn about farming? Did you go to school for it or was it just a natural thing that came about with you? Um, well, my degree is actually in philosophy, Oh. so I'm a lover of wisdom, hence yeah. the name philosophy. Um, but I started working on local farms uh, at the age of 11, but even before that, my family, all, we always had a large garden. We also had a couple of dozen pear trees in our yard, so I was always growing up in the garden, in the dirt. Uh, we also sold pears on the roadside, huh. and then I started working on local farms at the age of 11. My first job was picking old. raspberries, getting paid by the pint, wow. and I moved up to blueberries then picking beans by the bushel. Wow. So One year we had a huge um, apple crop um, that got hit by hail. And we actually, I got paid 50 cents a bushel to pick them up off the ground, and those got sent to very fine for apple juice. Really? Was the this next was year I graduated to getting paid by the hour. <laughs> picking corn and tomatoes. Yeah. So I really learned from the ground up. Uh, and I think for agriculture and, and farming, that's the best way to learn with your hands in the dirt. That's it, hands-on training. That's yep. the best way of doing it. Yep. Uh, after college, I, um, I, uh, I served in the Peace Corps in Ecuador and because they felt that I had enough experience and, and knowledge uh, to be able to teach others. But when I first got to Ecuador, they put me through a pretty intense three-month training program for culture, really? language, and agriculture itself. So I learned some of the more academic sides of uh, agriculture. Um, and since then, I've, I've taught agriculture a lot as well around the world. So you teach it too then, huh? Yeah. That's great. All ages you teach, I mean, 
Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, this Saturday I'm actually teaching a, a high school class, um, but I've done work in some countries teaching, you know, adults as, as old as 80, 85. Wow. Do you Everybody do always has the capacity <laughs> to learn something else. Excuse You've learned me. a lot today already, haven't you? I sure you? have. I mean, yeah. even before the show we talked, it was like unbelievable. Do you do school tours of the farm? We do. Uh, we're actually just starting them this year, and I've been getting requests for school tours for years. And I always kept saying, you know, I'm too busy, I'm too busy. But this year we're finally offering school tours on the farm um, starting this September. Um, and we're going to see how that goes, and we might actually um, do it again in the spring with the greenhouses because a lot of kids, especially in the spring, they're not getting outside much. Well, we can bring them into the greenhouse where it's nice and warm, and we're growing fruits and vegetables and start teaching them about where their food comes from because that's another thing I'm seeing you know, through the years. Uh, the, the next generations that are coming up are, are getting further and further away from understanding where their food comes from. A lot of them feels like, well, it comes from the supermarket. Yeah, so, right. My mission is not only growing a lot of good food and providing that food to people so that they eat healthily, but also now to, to educate people on where the food comes from, why food is so important to us, and some of the intricacies of how it's grown. Wow. So this here is just a sample of what you grow, right? I mean, you grow a lot more than this. Oh, sure. Yeah, I yeah. mean, different types of vegetables. Yeah. All through the season, different, different things. We try to have as much diversity as possible. Um, but we don't, we, with our CSA, I've learned to also not go crazy right. um, with weird things. But every week I try to throw in one oddball item, right. you know, like the Romanesco one week or maybe a purple cauliflower another week. Right. Um, you know, our, our celery, <clears throat> this here is some petite celery. Pe tiny. People have found that the, our celery flavor is just like four times more intense than the celery you'd get in the supermarket. So especially if you're going to make a soup you only need a fraction of this to make a good soup versus what you would normally get from out of California, Arizona. That's good to know. Yeah. Like, I like I've, haven't seen a lot of this in a market, in a regular market. Like yeah, market the American food or... system is kind of sad in that way. Um, they've found that it's really only about 20 vegetables that you tend to find in the supermarket. Right. But there, you can see there's so much more out there. It's and if you think about it, each different vegetable and fruit offers different nutrients, right? Yep. And they're yep. absorbing nutrients out of the soils, and then we consume that, and that puts nutrients in our bodies. Right. Well, if we're only eating 20 different ones, we're probably not getting all the nutrients we should from our food, hence needing the need for supplements. Exactly. And maybe yep. that could be related to some poor health issues as well. So if we diversify our food so that we're getting different nutrients because those different foods are providing different nutrients, then theoretically we should be healthier in the long run. Right. Now, how would we cook a lot of this? Boil it or steam it or the peppers I know you can bake. Yeah. I mean, uh, eggplants you can fry and bake. I actually eat a lot of it kind of raw. You know, oh yeah, raw too, really. It's the best way. Yeah, that's what people say. It's the best nutrients for you too with the vitamins. Yeah. When you eat it raw, you lose nothing. Right. Um, in the fall, I've started to roast more and more. So, because you usually have to heat your house, right, in the fall, right. it starts to get cool. You just get home, you crank on that oven, you take a whole bunch of vegetables, chop them up, throw a little bit of olive oil and salt on them, throw them on the cookie sheet and in the oven at not too high of a temperature, just keep flipping it around every 15 minutes ago, and in about an hour, you have this wonderful um, food, and I find that by roasting it, you, you seem to bring out the flavors more and right. the flavors intensify more as well. Right. And you heated your house at the same time. <laughs> now, I heard cooking eggplant, I like it mine peeled, mm -hmm. but they say that all the nu nutrients are in the skin? Correct. Not all, but the majority. It's the same thing with an eggplant, potato, an apple. Well, if you peel it, I mean, what's the purpose of peeling it? Right. I mean, usually, the, yeah, the skin can be a little tough, yeah. but the skin serves to protect the innards. Um, but the skin is also where the majority of the nutrients are. Yeah, so, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't peel it. See, I, I don't like the skin. Now, these. well, if you try my eggplant, you might find the skin is not nearly as tough because a lot of the a lot of the fruits and vegetables you find in the supermarket, they have to be shipped, and stored, and so oftentimes they're actually breeding varieties now that have a thicker skin, uh -huh. so that they will last longer in transit. And they can do that. They do that. I choose varieties not for their shipping qualities. 
because if you're a large commercial grower, you want to make sure that that product that you're growing, that eggplant, is going to get to the end supermarket in one piece, because otherwise you're going to say, hey, your eggplant rotted on us. Oh, yeah. But if it has a nice, thick skin, right. they get less loss. Right. But it's your loss, because right. you're losing a lot of the uh, good characteristics, and then you end up peeling it and throwing away the majority of the nutrients. So I choose the varieties for flavor and nutrient density and grow them in a way also that, like apples for example, if you're gonna store those apples or ship them, you tend to pick them a little bit immature. Mm -hmm. I like to pick my apples fully mature for best flavor. And the skin might be a little bit more tender, right? but you're gonna love eating that apple. And you're gonna end up eating more of it and be that much healthier as a result. Wow. These, they're a different shape. Yeah. That's a, that's a radish, uh, it's a, called a French breakfast. The variety name is Davignon. If you go to France, you'll find that radish everywhere. You tend to not see the small red radish so much in France. Yeah. And the, the flavor, I think, is a little bit much milder. You don't get a very strong radish flavor. Right. We also do grow the regular red radish as uh -huh. well. Uh -huh. So again, that's where we throw in some of that diversity. That's different. Yeah. This is different also. Beets. It's Beets a different and type of beet. Isn't it? Uh, it's a more traditional beet. We also grow some golden beets, um, a Chiogia beet, which uh, is also known as a um, candy stripe beet. If you uh -huh. cut it in half, it's got white and red stripes. Um, I find beets, and some people don't care for beets, they kind of have an earthier flavor. Yeah. But if you think about it, my opinion, beets are mining the soil of nutrients, and then you're consuming all those nutrients. Again, it's all about yeah. health. You can roast beets, you can steam them, also, the beet tops, the beet greens, are super healthy as well. Jeez. Yeah, and they're, they're very similar to this one here, which is the, the Swiss chard, and yeah, they're right. in the same family. And yeah. you can see the Swiss chard leaves, oh, in yeah. this case, this is a rainbow Swiss chard, they don't right. look all that dissimilar. Right. So eat your beet greens as well as your beets. <laughs> Sounds good, excellent. This one here, do you recognize that one? Uh, yeah. <laughs> this one here is called kohlrabi. We don't grow very much of it. But again, just to, for a little bit of diversity in the CSA shares, it looks kind of like an alien. Um, Definitely. But it's, a, it's very popular in Germany, kohlrabi. What do you eat it with? A lot of people will make a kohlrabi slaw, and they'll kind of mince it up, and much like you would make a coleslaw, yeah. you can make a kohlrabi slaw. Or you can just, you can peel it, or you can leave the skin on, you can slice it, add it to a salad, you can oftentimes just um, cut it up and put it in a crudité and have it raw. It's very That's good, excellent. it's different. Now, you have to rotate your crops every year, right? Correct. We do a lot of crop rotation. And the and that's reason for that is? Uh, different, different reasons. Uh, different crops are mining different nutrients from the soil, from different depths. Uh -huh. So if we grow a radish on the same soil every year, well, those roots are only going down a foot. But if we the next year put in corn, well, those roots are going to go down three feet. So it's accessing different nutrients in the soil, depending on that depth. Also, it helps to break uh, insect and disease uh, cycles. Huh. Uh, we're not certified organic, but we grow our crops using a lot of different organic methods. A lot of our crops are not even sprayed. A lot of our crops are, some of our crops are sprayed with just organic sprays. Yeah. Um, so that, having that, that crop rotation makes it easier for us to grow more organically. Really? And again, that, and that also, if, that's the other problem with monoculture, agriculture, when you're just growing one crop, you know, right. a field of corn over a thousand acres, right. and then the next year, and the next year, corn and corn and corn again, you're going to build up a lot of different diseases and pests that you now need to apply pesticides for. Oh, I so understand. So we, I wrote, I have, I have maps of my fields going back the te past 10, 15 years, so that so you know. in the winter I plan out the fields and I'll look back to see when the last time we planted something in that same family. Right. It's not only the same crop, but like peppers and tomatoes are right. in the same solanaceous family. So we'll try to rotate away from those crops for several, as much as five years, in fact, wow. to break the disease cycles. Wow. Do you Potatoes, for example. Yeah. Potatoes and eggplant are a magnet for the Colorado potato beetle. And I've learned, that's the nice thing. On one hand, it's a, it's a logistical nightmare having these farms everywhere. On the other hand, it makes it that much easier for me to break those insect cycles. Because that insect, the Colorado potato beetle, for example, will overwinter in the soil. So if you plant eggplant or potatoes there again the next year, you have that many more of them. If you plant them a thousand feet away, uh -huh. they're gonna fly a little bit. 
They don't fly far, but they'll fly, fly somewhat. Wow. But if I rotate it from one farm to another, mm -hmm. a mile away, then I've totally broken that insect cycle. They're gonna be lost. And sure. I've learned that over the years to flip that uh, tomato and a, uh, potato, uh, potato and eggplant from one farm to the next, right. not just within the same farm a thousand feet, right. but totally flip it a mile. Excellent, yep, yeah, right. Fertilizer, you use mm -hmm. fertilizer? Uh, I'm sure you do. You oh, sure. You yeah, use yeah, some yeah. type of yeah. fertilizer. Yeah, we, we use a lot of, um, it's called K-Mag. It comes from the Great Salt Lake. Really? Uh, it has a lot of potassium, um, sulfur, and magnesium as well. We also uh, do a lot of composting of leaves and um, grass clippings. We also grow a lot of green manures. That's a crop that we will seed in the field with the intention of just plowing it under so that as it rots down, it, it, it adds to the soil and the fertility of the soil to then provide a healthier, more fertile soil for the crop that we're going to eat. Excellent. <clears throat> so you had a pretty good crop this year then. Uh, it the actually was. It yeah. was good for you and everything. Yeah, last year was a challenge because of the drought. Right. Um, we ran short on water in some fields. Right. But on the flip side, last year there was no disease right. because there was no rain. Right. This year we're having a little bit more disease problems because of the uh, added humidity, but things are just growing beautifully. One more question. How do you get the water to the fields? With water conveyance systems. <laughs> <laughs> we, <laughs> How stupid I am. <laughs> we pump water out of the ponds or out of the wells. Uh, we have a system of pipes that brings it to the fields. Depending on the crop, in some cases we have sprinklers. Right. In a lot of cases it's drip irrigation lines, just a hose that runs at the base of the plant and that water will just slowly drip out and that helps us save about 75% of the water that we would need otherwise uh, to excellent. grow that crop. That's excellent. Yeah. Well, Dave, I think we're out of time, and I want to thank you for joining us today. And thank you all out there for joining us today as well. Be sure to come back next time, and I'll see you around town.